special video preview of the Bob Thurman podcast, Planetary Treason, Tibetan Plateau as Global Standing Rock. So, um, I just have a prayer for Tibet today. Om Mani Padme Hum. Everyone should be just chanting that. I couldn't afford to, the time or the money to go to Standing Rock personally. I, a lot of my friends went. I applaud everyone who went. I may have a hope chance to go in the future when I am more retired and have more time. I'll try to go. I like to do a sun dance there together with the wonderful Lakota people and the, or Blackfoot or Crow or whatever. I don't, I'm not into their own inner competitions. And um, they have natural friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood with Tibetan people. And it's all one, and they, and they all have brother sisterhood with all of us. And we're all just, you know, indigenous somewhere on this planet. The only ones who are wrecking it are those who think they're not indigenous. They have multiple passports. They live in Shangri-La hotels everywhere. <laughs> they, they don't know the price of grain of rice. They have no idea. They're just into worship of money. They live in a, they live in a, a money sphere rather than an ecosphere. We must be sympathetic with them. We are not against them. We are not. We don't want to harm them. We want to help them. No one is happy if they have many billions of dollars. It's a huge stress. You know, there could be a limit of a billion or something, half a billion, hundred million. You could have a limit. Although, if they earn any more, they could have a special directory where they could give. They could be the ones to direct giving it away. They actually do that anyway, but often when they're too old to really do it effectively. It's good when they do it younger and they can be more active and more, more, you know, more entrepreneurial in their giving. That's, that's the next step, actually. That's how we, they should be encouraged to be. Not deprived, not snatched away, not put down, thrown in a heap somewhere, or killed off like the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution. They, that's no good. They should be, in, they're, they're skilled people, they're lovely people especially first generation one. And they should be helped to have a more fun time. Genuine fun. Dealing with loving people, not people who are trying to get their stuff away from them. People who like them. That's what they all crave. Right? I'm sitting here in the Catskill Mountains on a beautiful cold day. And I've been reading the a memoir of a wonderful Tibetan Lama called Sogan Rinpoche, who I never met. He's from Amdo, from northeast Tibet, which is now incorporated in China's Qinghai province since the 1950s. And uh, he, he's talking about the troubles that he experienced as a youth. He was born in 1964, one year before Tibet was annexed into the, central Tibet was annexed into the People's Republic of China. Well, nine years after his homeland area was annexed into Qinghai province, as the Chinese invaded and Syria gradually annexed different parts of Tibet, the plateau, and finally now, of course, they have annexed all of the plateau. And he was talking about his sufferings, but somehow he managed to develop his spiritual practice all through that. But he doesn't dwell on that. He talks about how sweet that Lama was after having escaped, living in a tent, somewhere unable to move but taken care of by nomads secretly because at that point it was a it was a deadly sin to be caught saying oh money pay me home with your ro rosary in tibet at that time but anyway he gave, gives me great hope and joy and also a great sense of concern about my beloved tibet and our beloved tibet the world's beloved tibet you know, I am the chair of, uh, head of the Tibet House, U.S., 
although my wife really makes it happen and son, but I somehow have some sort of figurehead status and like the, being sitting on the prow of a ship, you know, I'm like that. And uh, so I must worry about it. And, you know, since we had this wonderful event recently of the Standing Rock group in the Dakotas, where they were trying to preserve the headwaters of the Missouri River and the water of their own cutback reservation. They once were the free range they had of all that area, the great northern steppe, the great northern plain, with they and their buffaloes, you know. And I've always dreamed of having, a, of, of planting, seeding herds of yaks there, actually. Some wild yaks like the wild, or like the wild buffaloes, and some domesticated ones, which could go better in a situation where it's not wide, it won't be completely wide open range again. And the yaks can, and then the, 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 nomad, the nomadism with the yaks could be somehow a little bit grafted in with the, with the Plains Indian culture, and they could be, have a new livelihood on their reservations, since they have a taboo about plowing, you know, and they can't become farmers. And also that area is not suited for that. It's a windy, high, wind swept. It's a grazing area, you know. So anyway, I had that fan, I've had that fantasy for ages. And I think I hope to see it happen someday and be a link between the, the sacred mountains of the Lakota people and the sacred Himalayas of the Asian people. And it's, it's one, there are two great standing rocks, let's say, in the, on, the two, on our continent and not to mention the continental divide and the Ute Indians and all of that. We really need a new, not embracing not only our Latinos and not only our Blacks, but also our native, our Reds, our native friends. So that we have the four, the four tribes in a way, or five tribes, then we would have the five tribes. We would have, we would have us, and we, I don't call us the whites, we are the pinks. Blotchy pink is what the white people are. So the pinks, the blacks, the browns, the reds, and the yellows. I don't know if there's, I don't know any greens, too bad. The, the, the dolphins are the blues and the greens, but we need a few more colors. But then we have those, then, then America will be really, the, it will realize itself when all of these are equal, all of these are brothers and sisters, it will really be wonderful. And we will be natural brothers and sisters with everyone on the entire planet. And it will be really wonderful. And it's coming soon, I do think, I really do. And I know it looks really awful right now. And I'm, and I'm, I lose sleep about it, actually. And it's, but, but I believe this will be the case. In any case, I want to think about Tibet with you and about how it is something like a 60-year-long standing rock. And the whole connection of rock and water, you know, and the elements in Chinese and Tibetan culture, there's this system of five elements, which are earth, wood, uh, water, you know, fire, rock, or st metal or rock, and water. And they go in a cycle like that. There's five of them. And, you know, like earth is the mother of wood. Wood is the mother of fire. Fire is the mother of iron, uh, you know, taking rock, making iron rock, dealing with rock. And then interestingly, rock is the mother of water. So Standing Rock has a beautiful idea in that they're water keepers and water preservers and somehow the water comes from the rock. From the, and rock, metal also comes from, metal is just kind of like hard water. And when it's really hot enough, it's, it's fluid. It's interesting. So it's a beautiful thing. And, and the Tibetans, I have a total interest in seeing the Standing Rock prevail and getting us past this uh, oil, petroleum, militarized, consumerized, petroleumized culture, which has ruined our agriculture and it's ruined our communication systems and it's ruining our atmosphere and it ruins our water and it, it creates all these chemicals that are poisoning our food and everything. And we have to get past that system with which we are self-destroying ourselves as human beings. It gives some sort of bursts of growth. It seems to be very prospering and wonderful, but actually it's a long-term effect. It's self-destructive. 
It's a kind of cancer, actually, the petroleum industry. Cancer, you realize, is a very prosperous tissue. When you get a tumor, it grows like mad and it's uncontrolled and it's really, it's a, it's a, if it's growth that you want, it's very prosperous. But unfortunately, it's a kind of growth that destroys the host where it grows. And the petroleum industry and culture, the whole petroleum culture is a cancerous growth that is destroying its host, which is the earth, water, fire, wind, air of the planet, of the whole planet. It's being destroyed. And so we have to, so standing rock, standing Himalayas, standing Swiss, Mont Blanc, standing Kilimanjaro, standing Andes, standing Rockies, all these mountains are the source of the water. They catch the clouds and then the water drips down from the mountain, from the rocks. So the standing rock is what we need to pay attention to. And they are all interconnected. Tibet, what's interesting, so it was the last place where colonialism prevailed. Last major huge giant place was the Tibetan Plateau, roof of the world, three mile average altitude, almost three mile average altitude, and uh, as large as all of the U.S. west of Mississippi, as large as all of Western Europe, as large as the rest of China, now that it's in China, combined. Almost. If China had dropped off Xinjiang and Tibet and Manchuria, T Tibet would have been the same size as China, with one thousandth the number, or one ten thousandth the number of people because of the altitude. And the fact that you can't really plow it in broad, just a little bit, some river valleys and next to rivers in small areas. But the main acreage, the main square miles can't be plowed because it's a high step. So nomadism and grazing animals or, or browsing animals was the only way people could live there. So otherwise it makes a desert, you know, if you try to plow it. To listen to the full podcast, please visit BobThurman.com or subscribe via your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks for listening and Tashi Delek.